Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos in our group reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit by moving on today in this 20th lecture to the section of the text titled A, The True Spirit, The Ethical Order. Now, the interesting thing about this section of the text, if you look at your own copy of the book, is that um, this section is incredibly short, at just two paragraphs long, yet it is, ironically enough, all the more difficult to understand for that very reason. Just as you might recall, that the 12th lecture had dealt with the um, pleasure and necessity section, which said a lot about the story of Faust without actually explicitly narrating those events or even making it clear which scene exactly it was that Hegel was referring to at a given moment, um, you may not even know that the um, section we are dealing with now is actually about Sophocles' play Antigone, yet this narratological context will be absolutely crucial for understanding what is going on here. If we look at the first of the two paragraphs, paragraph 444, it notes at the beginning that um, because spirit is, in its simple truth, consciousness, it forces its moments apart. In other words, whereas the last section had introduced the ideal of spirit as something like a unified world, rather than the disconnected subject of the preceding phase of reason, and therefore a world which must be ultimately unified by ethical action, which is much more perfect than, say, the detached observation of a single rational subject we saw in the, uh, say, observing reason phase, we now find at the earliest stage of spirit that this unity of the world of spirit is already split up, yet it is split up precisely by the action which seems to be ethical. Hegel noted himself that action divides it into substance and consciousness of substance, or more specifically, action splits substance into the uh, concrete moral act on the one hand and the ethical community on the other. In logical terms, the middle term mediating between these two is, of course, just the self-conscious agent, who is both the one who performs the ethical act is also a member of that community. Action holds this paradoxical role of dividing rather than uniting the world of spirit because at this stage action is still interpreted as being just my action as opposed to the community which has an objective character um, as substance, which at this stage still seems to be merely standing there, quote unquote. At least initially, it would seem that the latter is, in fact, so objective as to require my ethical action to awaken it from that dormant state into one which is fully awake. The conscious ethical agent, in this sense, merely actualizes what is potential within substance. This short pair of paragraphs, though, is more than enough to show that the individual's action at this stage does far more than simply actualize the potentialities of substance in a fully symmetrical manner, for it is precisely action carried out in a biased and individualized manner which splits the world up into so many city-states. Nor is the relation between these city-states always peaceful, for Athens and Sparta, for example, worship different patron gods and fight against one another. Each city-state, in turn, emerges as a separate thing with properties, which takes us all the way back to Section 2, in stark contrast with the ideal of a spiritually unified world, which should characterize this 20th section of the text. Interestingly, each city-state is a thing with just two properties, really. As Hegel noted himself in paragraph 445, it thus splits itself up into distinct ethical substances, these are, as an aside, the different city-states, um, and into two different laws, on one hand the human law and on the other the divine law. While human law presides over one's civic duties such as, say, participation in political processes or the defense of one's city-state in war, divine law presides over one's duty to one's family. 
Well, human law is public in its concerns and is archetypally associated with masculinity, divine law is private in its concerns and is archetypally female. The problem with the kind of concrete action carried out by the ethical agent at this phase is that one is allowed the opportunity to privilege one of these laws over the other in that one's act only is required <laughs> to consider one of them if it is merely mine. One finds out far too late, however, the consequences of adopting so, un, uh, so um, incomplete and one-sided a view of the law. At this point, though, we can move on to discuss Sophocles' play Antigone itself as really the perfect example of this sort of conflict. You might recall that in this play, Creon inherits the throne as king of Thebes on something of a legal technicality after both of Oedipus's only two sons kill each other in battle, and he basically is the next person in line, though not exactly a legitimate heir. Creon seizes his power as king to act in a way that seems ethical to him by mandating that only one of the two brothers killed in battle be given a proper burial, on grounds that the other one didn't deserve it because he had violated the human laws over the proper means of conducting warfare. Although this seems perfectly ethical to the masculine king who is considering only human laws regulation of warfare as a public matter, Antigone, the sister of the two brothers, violates this mandate of the king in order to give her brother a proper burial on grounds that the divine law over family <coughs> relations required her to violate the human law of the king. Without spoiling the plot, I can simply tell you that Creon finds out the hard way that in a competition between human law and divine law, the gods themselves will not favor even a king who seems to have absolute power if he pretends that only the former exists and completely neglects the latter. Although several generations of postmodernist deconstructivism might cause us to ignore the gender dimensions of this play, it really is not a coincidence that Antigone represents the divine law of family relations as a female character, while Creon represents the human law of war as a male character. This binary opposition between male and female in an era before that of gender fluidity in which the two make up a smooth continuum, not meaning to open up that can of worms, just saying in the ancient Greek context, these really were seen as a strict binary. Um, that only proves that the thing's own properties are in conflict with one another, and ultimately this opposition in which even the thing's own properties are actually uh, impossible to reconcile at this stage, this only ends up breaking the thing itself up. As Hegel concludes the section, I know that it was precisely in this development that the ethical order has been destroyed.